hello, this is Jeff Walton from the Institute on Religion and Democracy in Washington, DC. I'm joined today by uh, Canon Georgette Forney, a uh, Anglican deacon who serves as uh, uh, head of Anglicans for Life, a uh, organization that has existed uh, across several decades um, to give witness to sanctity of life uh, causes uh, within the uh, worldwide Anglican communion. Um, thanks so much for uh, joining me, Ken and Georgette. I appreciate it. Great to be with you and your guests and your listeners. Yeah, um, one of the things that uh, a lot of people aren't necessarily uh, aware of is uh, the work that Anglicans for Life does uh, not so much just in the advocacy space, but also in the local ministry space. Um, you're an organization that sort of prepares uh, Anglicans uh, to witness within their local communities and prepare their, their congregations. Um, tell me a little about what that sort of looks like uh, in, uh, in, in churches on the local level. Well, we use a chapter model is how we refer to it. So we have chapters uh, in churches throughout the country. And what we try to do is, on the one hand, we try to equip the chapter to do local ministry. But the key thing for us is that it has to be based on what the chapter wants to do. We don't try to dictate to them what we think they should be doing because we don't know their community. So one chapter might be doing ministry to university students that are facing unplanned pregnancies and needing help, you know, living on campus as a pregnant student. Another chapter might be focusing on the local nursing home and how can they um, augment some of the services, uh, whether it is really like a worship service or if it's just coming alongside some of the residents in that nursing home to encourage them, pray with them and that sort of thing. So every chapter is going to be its own um, identity and have its own uh, particular focus. Uh, we focus on five particular topics with tons of subtopics in there. So obviously abortion is our number one topic, but we also are very much interested in preventing uh, assisted suicide in euthanasia. We also recognize the importance of engaging our youth. So we do um, uh, abstinence or um, sexual risk avoidance behavior, as it's now called. We also look at the biotech issues. We look at and uh, how is uh, the researchers um, looking at ethical ways to do research versus unethical ways. So we have our, our eyes and ears open to the biotech issues. And then finally, uh, the adoption issue is critical. And not only do we have a, a specialist on our staff that focuses just on adoption, whether it's international adoption, foster care adoption, all of that, um, but we also have a donation fund that people can give to or um, actually receive grants from for uh, adoption costs. So we, um, we cover a big, field of topics, if you will. Yeah, thank you very much. That gives a good uh, context to uh, your ministry's work. Um, a lot of people, of course, have been talking in regards to abortion policy, which you referenced as a, a major focus of Anglicans for Life ministry, that uh, in obviously the, the Dobbs decision, which mm -hmm. um, uh, removed uh, abortion policy from the federal level and brought it down to the state level, um, there have been significant changes in a number of states uh, regarding uh, abortion. Um, in those states that have changed their laws, um, what are you hearing from local pregnancy centers? And what are some of the new challenges and the new opportunities that are being reported? I think I would probably answer the, the what, I'm, what we're hearing from pregnancy centers. Um, Charlotte Lozier Institute just finished a, a big study and released it, I think it was two weeks ago. And the increase in the services and, and support that they provided women last year in 2023 um, was substantial. So um, going right along with that, last year we hosted the world's largest baby shower. And I think almost 40 uh, churches, Anglican churches participated in that. And they collected at the local level and then donated to the local pregnancy center. So it was really kind of fun without knowing it, but intuitively figuring that more women were gonna need services, 
we created a, a campaign, a plan, a, a, a fun activity. So our all of our chapters were able to jump in and do that. And I, I want to say we donated uh, across all those churches, almost 30,000 diapers. And the whole list is really quite fun to go through and look at, but a great deal of resources. So we are continuing to encourage churches to partner with pregnancy centers and see that um, helping women at a, at a really basic level is ensuring they have the necessities to care for their child. But not only are those things material items, but the churches are offering mentoring and discipleship and that sort of thing, which the, again, the partnership with the pregnancy centers works through. I would say the second part of that, the second part of your question relates to um, something that's harder to, it, it's almost like talking about jello being pinned to the wall is how I feel right now. That there's this misconception that when Roe was quote unquote overturned and went back to the States, that we've, we've, we've won the battle and we're done. And there's really nothing further from the truth because we've just changed the, you know, the, the location of the battle. But in some ways, um, we're seeing numbers of abortions increasing um, in many states. Here in Pennsylvania, where I live, I think the number was 5,000 more than last year. And that's in part due to the fact that people are coming from other states and women are just given the economy and everything, I, I believe that there's a greater concern. So the harder part is the, and the harder way to answer your question is that we're seeing people disengaging when in reality, we need to actually engage at a, at a more intense level. I, I know maybe some people shy away from being intense, but um, we're actually in the midst of uh, um, rolling out, um, uh, unveiling a list of strategies that we believe that people need to be doing locally. Um, uh, I've written uh, nine strategies, all focused on abortion, uh, that each strategy has three to five tactics, if you will, or subtopics. And my, my, my vision and what I feel like the Lord showed me was that what people end up doing when we talk about abortion is that they talk about the legality of it, the politics of it, but nobody talks about what is an abortion procedure really do? Or what is the humanity and the development of the child really all about? So with this new strategy system that we're developing, we're calling it Speak Up for Life, we're encouraging people to take one strategy and one subtopic of that strategy. And we're giving them some information and a lot of um, resources and links to other articles so they can become an expert on simply one subtopic, something as simple as um, the 60% of abortions now are being done with abortion pills. Well, mm -hmm. talking about that topic is a big topic but one drilling down point on it is that environmentally, these abortion pills are getting into our wastewater systems, not only in the chemical of the pill, but because we're flushing these human remains down the toilet. So if somebody's interested in environmental issues and life issues, becoming an expert on one point is, is, is what we need. We need a bunch of people to become an expert on one point and then make a commitment that every day they tell one person their point. Think about how we could in, educate, engage, and, and kind of um, um, reverse the misinformation that the mainstream media keeps putting out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. I uh, was... Uh looking at the uh, most recent uh, newsletter, this is the uh, quarterly newsletter from Anglicans for Life Carpe Diem. And uh, you had uh, written uh, that um, uh, in the United States, uh, about 30% of pregnancies are unintended. And of those, uh, about 40% are terminated uh, by abortion. 
And the number you gave was between 1,500 to 2,500 abortions per day in this country, which would be about 20% of all pregnancies in the U.S. ending in abortion. Um, that's a, a pretty dramatic figure. Um, in regards to um, the judicial and legislative landscape, it's obviously changed, as we've mentioned. Um, when regards to uh, that, that's kind of that that one thing someone can focus on. Mm -hmm. What are you mentioned uh, the environmental issue is one. What are a couple of the others that um, people could uh, potentially uh, learn more about that could be helpful in advancing sanctity of life? I think um, it, uh, there's a, a variety of points that we're pushing for you to make about the humanity of the baby, the development mm -hmm. of the child. Um, something as simple as, did you know that unborn babies start to be able to hear in utero? Like, I mean, giving, helping people appreciate the humanity that, that there is in a 14 week old baby in your womb, that we're not just cutting out a, a bunch of tissue. This is a human being created in God's image. So the idea of focusing in on the um, development of the child is mm -hmm. a, a simple point. Um, another one that uh, I think is really a tough one to do, but talking about the actual abortion procedures. So, you know, we use that word abortion, we talk about it, but what do you, you know, like when you think about abortion, what do you actually mean by that? Do you realize in an abortion procedure that a doctor takes a, a scapula and, and, and literally pulls that child apart limb by limb? I mean, I can't even yeah. say those things without getting an emotion because it just floors me that we do this mm -hmm. day in and day out. If we could talk to our neighbors and just tell them that simple point, would they still think, oh, it's no big deal? Would they understand a little better why abortion is wrong? So you know, maybe it's that. Maybe it's talking about women who have had abortions mm -hmm. and the, the, the grief they live with, the uh, insomnia, the nightmares. Um, I just uh, working on one of those topics and you know what? 47% of women who have abortions consider suicide. Think about it. I, mm. I, I what, what's the word? Idealize about it. Um, I can never remember that word. Um, but they're, they're thinking about it. They're dreaming mm. about it. They're trying to mm. be reunited with their child, possibly. Mm. Um, ideation, that's the word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, there's lots of those topics. Um, you know, mm. if you're into... Um, legislation, maybe um, given the fact that we're dealing with a number of challenges in the courts, and if you have a legal background and you're retired, maybe helping write amicus briefs for nonprofits representing the sanctity of life. I mean, everybody can pick a topic that share that connects with their passion. And I think we really have to be doing that because if we don't, um, we know the other side doesn't have any hesitancy about killing, about ending the lives of children. And if we, they can't do it in the womb, they're going to do it somewhere along the way with drugs, um, with, you know, hormones now. I mean, there is a part of our culture that is undermining the humanity and sanctity and value of every human being. And then there are God's people that have to be the voice of truth. Mm -hmm. You've uh, speaking of that about being the voice of truth. Um, Anglicans for Life uh, has been sounding the alarm for years about something that's become known as medical aid and dying in uh, both Canada and several U.S. states. Um, Ten of them. How has yeah? How, how has this changed perceptions of euthanasia among the public? And what can we as Christians do to protect vulnerable people within our congregations? Um, there's a couple of uh, things that we need to recognize. And, I, and again, this kind of goes back to your previous question, because one of the key things that we have to do is we have to take back control over the words that we're using uh, versus the propaganda they're using. 
So when you say medical aid in dying, what you're really talking about is injecting grandma with a lethal concoction to kill her. Um, do you really support doing that? Mm -hmm. Why? Why Why do we want to hasten death? Why can't we not fear death, but see it as a sacred part of life? Um, I've walked with a number of folks now who have died and in, in my family, as well as dear friends. And it is critical to me that we help them die faithfully by living to the end of, of their purposes that God created them for. So I think the key to uh, fighting medical aid and dying is to not refer to it as that, but to refer to mm -hmm. it as physician assisted suicide where mm -hmm. where the the physician is writing the prescription and giving the person the medication yeah. um but i also think that not re not letting them use medical aid and dying but euthanasia you know euthanasia when i started this job in in uh 1998 euthanasia was like something out of science fiction and nobody would believe it and now Canada has euthanized over 30,000 people in less than, what, 10 years, eight years? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think changing the, 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 the words and making sure we're in charge of the words again. Mm -hmm. And then I think, um, and I'm going to do a shameless plug here, um, mm -hmm. talking to, ch uh, having churches do a class on aging and dying where they bring up these issues. They put this topic on the table. Um, I have a, a standard joke. It's not really a joke, but a standard line I use in a lot of my presentations where I ask people, when's the last time you heard a sermon on death? And the reality is we don't preach on death. Now, there was a great exception to that. And it was when I was with a group of chaplains, um, army and, and um, um, armed forces chaplains. And that group of people, they said, we preach on it almost every week because those folks are facing it. And it taught me a great lesson about the fact that they were able to be honest about death because they knew people were facing it. I think we think we can just kind of put death in a closet and, and keep avoiding it. But the reality is we're all going to die. And if we prepare ourselves and one another and our families it can be a, a sacred experience for everyone. Well, Anglicans for Life produced a curriculum a, a couple of years ago called Embrace the Journey. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll be honest with you, I wrote it partially because my parents were getting to the point where they were aging and I was aware their, their death would be coming in, in years to come. Mm -hmm. um, the irony was my mom died before I got to show it to her. She died six weeks later. So I always say that I was the first student of Embrace mm -hmm. the Journey because mm -hmm. I don't think I would have survived her death had I not done the preparation in writing it. Um, you know, even talking about how to plan a funeral, um, what happens when you die? Um, what does, what is grief? Why do we grieve? But we also talk about assisted suicide, euthanasia, but we talk about things like hospice in there. We talk about um, advanced care planning. How do we want to finish our lives uh, faithfully? So I think that the more that we, what's the word I wanna say? Um, take the, the, the blinders off, um, reveal and pull back the cover on the discussions about death. The more we feel empowered to not fear it, and know that we're prepared to handle it. And, and again, mm. I would say the key is mm. always having wonderful and important conversations with family members. So everybody's on the same page and everybody understands the priorities that the, the aging family member has so they can die faithfully and gracefully instead of hastening it through a, a lethal injection. Yeah, those are great words. Thank you for sharing them. Um, Let's tell uh, those who are watching and listening, where can they access these resources like the, uh, the the curriculum that you mentioned? Yeah, Embrace the Journey and our new Speak Up for Life. Speak Up for Life is still literally being written right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, but that will be on our website. Our website is anglicansforlife.org. 
Well, great. And uh, just so folks know as well, there is a big event coming up here in my area, Washington, D.C. Um, Anglicans for Life uh, co-hosts with the Anglican Diocese of the Mid-Atlantic, uh, a life summit. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be taking place um, at the end of next week to coincide with the National March for Life. Yep. And you can still get virtual tickets. So if somebody and there's still in-person tickets available. So if somebody's local and wants to attend in person, we'd love to have you join us. But virtually, you can also attend. And we've got a great lineup of speakers as well as um, unveiling our new Speak Up for Life. Great. And I'll include a link to that in the show notes below. Well, thanks so much for uh, sharing time with me, Georgette. I appreciate it. And I uh, appreciate the ministry that. Uh, that you do to uh, speak up for the vulnerable and to prepare those of us that are in the pews um, to do the same. Uh, thank you very much. My pleasure. Blessings to you. Thanks.